Nick and Nick, I want to get right down to the secret sauce. Most people launch a business and launch one successfully like you do, and then focus on media and social, uh, and social media and marketing. You guys did the opposite. Tell me a little bit about how you secured the sauce handle in 2015 and how you got to launching Trough. Yeah, so back in 2015, we got the Instagram handle sauce, and we knew this was valuable real estate on the internet, specifically social media. Um, and you know, Nick and I, we just started curating this awesome Instagram feed with content we thought would resonate well with the pop culture foodie. Eventually decided to create a hot sauce um, that we could you know, push through this channel that we built online. So we developed a community, and then we decided, hey, let's create the world's first top shelf luxury condiments brand. Nick, can you talk a little bit about that too? What that was like, I know that you guys spent, what was it, two and a half years in your parents' garage kind of perfecting the recipe? Yeah, so it started with the account and we created this following that there was no intention to make a hot sauce. It was more like, let's make a cool feed for the internet. This was 2015 Instagram, which was a completely different landscape than today. And after a while, this feed just started to take off, and we were like, hey, we should make a cool sauce for this following. And then, but that could look like so many different things. <clears throat> and what we landed on was a top shelf, luxurious, truffle-inspired pot sauce that looked like an alcohol bottle, essentially. Mm -hmm. So you guys even made the bottle, the top of the bottle like emulates the look of a truffle, which I noticed I personally was a huge sauce, truffle, truffle fan, like for truff sauce for a long time. Um, and so the different flavors also came to the fore. But I think prior to that, you were also thinking about, you know, whether you're gonna get into merchandise. And I think I was reading that media was also a strategy. You didn't have to develop the sauce. So what made you focus on the CPG route, both of you, versus going you know, going into the product route versus just content, because you were already going viral. Yeah, so originally we were thinking of creating this really cool platform online that had sauce, the Instagram handle is the forefront, and dropping merch similar to you know, Supreme. Um, and then eventually we saw that there was a large white space and opportunity in the sauce category. We didn't see any top shelf luxury condiment. We didn't see any top shelf um, luxury condiment brand that was taking a digitally native social media direct-to-consumer approach. So that's really what kind of sparked our interest. And we said, hey, we should create a consumer brand and go all in on the hot sauce category first. And so Jay, I know that the deal happened in November of this year. We talked about it, it was like the hottest deal in the space, got picked up everywhere. <laughs> But tell me, I don't know, I'm a, like I said, a self-proclaimed hot sauce aficionado. Was Truff already on your radar? Was it on your TikTok account, your kid's TikTok account? Well, how, did, how did you first come to hear about Truff before you got introduced to the guys? Yeah, of, of course it was. And first, thanks for having us. Um, of course it was. A, a big part of our job as dedicated, branded consumer investors is to know about all the great brands that are being built by great entrepreneurs like Nick and Nick. And they were notoriously difficult to get to. Um, they were building a great business and a great <coughs> brand, and they were doing it um, incredibly successfully, leveraging, you know, obviously a phenomenal product, but met with the digital uh, backdrop that they had meticulously built. Um, but you know, up to the point when we started to engage with them, private equity had not been on their radar screen. Um, but uh, yeah, of course, we were watching it. Uh, it's our job to know about all the great brands that are being built like Truff. Mm -hmm. And what's your hot sauce tolerance? Oh, I like it hot. You like it hot, yeah. so do I. Um, so I'm gonna get to the partnership in a minute, but for I know that this is a conference of the world's biggest allocators, but for the entrepreneurs in the room, and that's what we cover at Forbes too, you guys have been in business for six years. Do you have any of the like, lessons learned along the way, especially as the media landscape was changing, the social media landscape was changing, the CPG landscape was changing? I was fascinated when I read that during the pandemic, so many brands struggled. But yet your business, I think you saw an uptick of 40%. Can you talk about that for a minute? Yeah, I think um, our thing has always been like being very patient. Um, and so our like brick by brick approach kind of gave us this foundation of, I think, an authentic customer base. And when, you know, a lot of brands, to your point, they, they raise and they hit it hard and they uh, really go for it. And for us, we thought, Let's just, let's just let the consumer help us build our business. And so when the pandemic hit, we had this amazing internet-based, you know, consumer base of truff fanatics. And everyone was at home, everyone was cooking. 
And it kind of gave us this, it threw like gas on the fire of what we were doing. And we were like set up for it. And so um, it really, we really had this opportunity to kind of just um, like grow like a weed during the time where it was very challenging for a lot of brands. We still faced all the challenges, supply chain, inflation, COVID, this and that. But as a whole, the demand for our product was there. And I think that was driven by like the authenticity of what we were doing in the first place. Yeah, you guys have a very loyal following. And so Nick G, on that point, just launching off of that a little bit, I want to talk about how the brand built this digitally native first identity and how that became your competitive advantage when you started talking to you know, the big box stores and the likes of the Whole Foods and Targets of what you're in right now. Yeah, so you, know, you look at the traditional condiments market and a lot of these brands were built in retail. And for us, we were able to build those one-to-one -one connections directly with our customers out the gate. So we really developed these strong relationships with our customers and we built a very loyal following. So when we did go into retail, we had a ton of data, we had a ton of reviews, a ton of customers that were already purchasing our product, and now we're just giving them you know, more places to find it. And it really enabled us to catapult our way into retail. Mm -hmm. We also had like a content story, so they can buyers can go to our feed and say, "Wow, this is what this brand is doing. This is the engagement they're getting. This is how they're approaching the category." Like there was actual kind of like a physical outlet for, which again, like I think we're saying, most brands didn't start online, especially in our category. And so I think we had uh, an edge on convincing the gatekeeper in whatever account you're talking about to say, "Oh wow, like people actually know what this is, regardless of how premium it is to the category." Yeah, and it, you built a really authentic community too, which is the hard part. A lot of businesses think about that afterwards. Right. And so I also found it really interesting that like you guys saw Amazon as a good partner. A lot of the businesses as they're coming up are scared about Amazon, but you guys kind of just leaned into it and embraced it. It took us a little bit to get to warm up to it. I think our, our first year we were like, no, we want the customers on our website. We want the data. We want the, the relationship. Um, and then we made it onto Oprah's favorite things list, and they have a partnership with Amazon, so all the products are featured on the list. And we were like, "This is a no we're stupid if we don't go on Amazon at this point," you know. And so that was our entrance to Amazon. Yeah. So tell tell me about what it was like getting on Oprah's favorite things list. I was going to ask about that. We we thought it was fake at first because this was a while ago, and <laughs> we got the inbound email like, "Hey, we want samples," and we looked at the. Googling the names, like this is there's so much spam. Right, and right. Like now this is a real person, like and send them samples. Oprah loves hot sauce and loves truffle, um, and so you know we found out we'd be on the list a couple months before it launches. Didn't know what to expect just because the list used to be the show, right? And then it segued to the internet, um, and so we just started calling all these brands like. Hey, what's it like? Um, and so I think it's different for every brand. We that year we were a top five brand on the list. Which yeah, was very cool. Um, but we also again had like the infrastructure to capture people coming to the website, like target. Like we kind of had the digital route to really capitalize on the list. Whereas a lot of kind of mom and pop brands that make it, they just they don't really know what to do with all the the eyeballs. Yeah, in some ways, it's the ultimate stamp of approval until you got the investment from Sky then. Exactly. Right? Only one so bigger the, stamp. Right, yeah. right. That's the only step up. So let's, let's uh, shift to that a little bit. I really found it fascinating when we were chatting. You guys had said that you met with over 100 private equity firms, but yet you would only do a deal with one firm, and that firm was Sky. So tell me, I mean, it's pretty self-explanatory. You have these two, like leaders in their own respective universes with Jay and Kim, but I want to, I would love to hear from both of you on what really sold you on that initial investment. Yeah, you know, over the years we've kept things pretty tight. We've had a ton of inbound um, leads or whatever you want to call them from potential investors that wanted to, you know, invest in Truff. And for us, we never really thought about going the PE route, but, you know, we heard about the Sky Partners Fund that was being raised by Jay and Kim, and um, we started to get to know them a little bit more. And we found that you know, they're truly authentic humans. They're great entrepreneurs. They're amazing operators. They're best in class with consumer. And they really understand culture, and they know how to connect the customer to the product or the brand through emotion. And for us, that's what Truff's been built off of, creating those emotional connections with our customers. And that's really what 
we saw was, you know, awesome. And so Nick, tell me a little bit about what that first meeting was like. You had some really great observations. Yeah, the, which, which first meeting specifically? Oh, ab about meeting with Jay yeah, yeah. and Kim. So, yeah, so there was a series of meetings over the course of a year. I think yeah. each one brought a new insight. Um, early on, it was clear that we all thought the same. I think, you know, going back to some of the other firms we had, you know, talked to or met with, and like Jay said, we weren't necessarily had our sights set on a PE deal over the years. Um, but what stood out was, um, like, if you think about most funds in our space, food and beverage, they kind of, I don't want to say they all have the same playbook, but I think they all think a certain way. And like Nick mentioned with, with Sky and Jay and, and Kim and team, their roots are in culture. And so I think we were really captivated by um, our ability to align on how to approach what it is that we're doing and how to do things the way that Trough has done things and Jay and Sky have done things their whole career. I mean, deals like the Supreme deal and the Beast by Day, Beach by Day, these are like the most culture-oriented brands of our time. And the alignment there just made so much sense. And I think we got excited about, we can keep on this path of how we want to go about approaching the market um, in like a cohesive way. I really loved also what you said about meeting Kim. And can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think, um, like Jay said, we got off the call like thinking, wow, this is an incredible founder. Um, like we felt like we were talking to, uh, we, we you know, talked to our, our peers in the space all the time in different businesses. And we really click when we really get deep in the weeds on business and like the passion of building something and growing something. And it was extremely clear to us that Kim is Nothing, Skims isn't an accident. She's in the weeds. She's constantly ideating. She's like, she's a machine in terms of actually having the passion to build a business. And I think that is maybe not always seen as so much on the forefront, but we felt like we were amped getting off the call. Like, wow, this is like, someone's here to build with us. This is amazing. Yeah, I loved when you said that you thought you were going into a meeting with this larger than life figure, this celebrity, right. and you left realizing what an incredible entrepreneur and business person she exactly. is. Exactly. And so, Jay, on the flip side, I want to hear from you. Um, this is a pretty big deal. This is the firm's stake in the ground. This is your first major investment. Why was Trough the right decision? Well, going back to the, the foundation of our firm, we are, we're built uh, with a focus to invest in disruptive high-growth consumer brands. We're focused on backing brands that, you know, as the guys said, are both uh, developing or have developed great products that meet a consumer need, but they're doing so in a way that drives really good emotional connectivity with consumers. And this was everything and more uh, as we look through that uh, through that lens. It's what I've done my whole career. It's what we'll be focused on going going forward. Um, we are not venture investors. We are not uh, early stage investors who want to fund operating losses and take that kind of risk. We want to back proven brands that through data and through knowledge and understanding and time and alignment and all the things that we can do, um, you know, can get behind businesses that have crossed through that proof point of, of what consumers want and expect from, from where they're interacting. Um, I think another thing that we really love about, about Truff um, is that it satisfies every uh, member of the value chain. So everyone from the consumer who's getting access to a phenomenal product and getting access to a flavor profile that they might not have thought they could get access to because of the luxury of Truff. It's delivering a great economic model to the retail partners in the middle, whether that's Amazon or bricks and mortar or uh, the company's own website. And it's obviously resulting in, in having built a great business for the benefit of Truff and now uh, for us as investors. I loved also how your values and stories, although different, aligned, right? Because it was a culture-driven first business. And I think even with your, you know, you're coming from more of the traditional PE route, but you were a disruptor in these culture-driven businesses within that, then your evolution now to Sky and then with Truff. And so I want to kind of talk a little bit about that. Inquiring minds always want to know, right? So at Forbes, we're always speaking to entrepreneurs that are like, how do I get on the radar of somebody like Kim, somebody like Jay with Sky Partners? Um, like, how did you guys first get connected? I think it was one of our partners... Um, knew somebody that knew somebody that knew somebody and it was kind of this game of telephone um, that got us on the phone with David um, and the conversation just started there very organically just talking shop and it just kept progressing very organically. 
Mm -hmm. yeah, and, and one thing I want to emphasize, they, they mentioned this, we got to know each other over a very long period of time. This type of, of investment, um, and I learned this over my career, it does not happen in a very truncated two or three week process because in a truncated two or three week process you can't build the most important aspect of partnership which is trust and mutual respect and the things that we all need to have, each other, have with each other. Um, in the room to go help and build build something great, and so we were methodical and careful, and uh, you know, in, in building that trust with uh, with you guys and your team, and that's a really important component that's different in the way that some more traditional private equity works, um, or the way a traditional uh, investment banked process works. Yeah. Um, so. And so, in terms of you know how to get on your radar, I'm sure there's entrepreneurs knocking down your door every single day. What, is there a certain type of profile business that you're looking for? I mean, Truff is an excellent example. But as you're looking to build out your portfolio, what are some of the key metrics or things you know, either it's growth or specific industries that you particularly find attractive right now that are going to kind of align with the Sky Partners portfolio? Sure. Um, well, first and foremost, we are, we are growth investors, so we look through the lens of, you know, what are the tailwinds that are driving growth and consumptive behavior across all consumer categories, and as a result, we're targeted, uh, we are focused on investing behind really high quality businesses and assets. We are not trying to fix things that are broken. We are trying to propel and amplify uh, businesses that are already on a phenomenal track. Um, the framework that I mentioned earlier about the balance between you know, delivering great product and doing so in a way that drives emotional connectivity, the reason we emphasize that emotional component is because emotional connectivity with brands, that's what drives loyalty. That's what drives a consumer to go home after they've tried a product and to post about it on a social media channel or to tell their friends in ways that um, you know, can amplify their voice bigger and broader than they've ever been able to do before. Um, that emotional connectivity drives a high level of repeat purchase, that drives lifetime value, the virality that comes from that brings down customer acquisition costs and, and solves what is the most challenging aspect of building a great consumer brand today, which is minimizing customer acquisition costs and maximizing lifetime value so that that economic model works really well. That's naturally going to take us to uh, high repeat purchase categories like food and beverage, like beauty and personal care, like apparel, accessories, and luxury. Uh, where the investments that the companies make in building brand and building community are rewarded with a consumer who keeps coming back. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really where, where we'll focus. Like I said, uh, we're, not, we're not taking startup risk. We're, we're not a, an early stage venture firm. We are, we are finding brands that have crossed through that, that point of profitability and cash flow positivity and really positive unit economics, all of which we measure by data, um, and then develop over time a really aligned value creation plan. What are the two or three or four things that we're going to make sure we do really well in partnership with our partners like Nick and Nick to win together. And importantly, when you do all of that and you work with the right people, it's so rewarding and so fun uh, mm -hmm. to win together. And I think about the companies that they compete against um, in their sector. They're some of the biggest, most well-capitalized consumer products companies in the world who theoretically or, or really have more resources uh, mm -hmm. than, than they have. Uh, but they're taking market share from these bigger uh, companies because they've delivered a product that consumers love mm -hmm. um, and have a really long runway to grow and win. And that's exactly the type of business and brand we're looking for. On that point, um, most people develop a viral product and then it's hard to branch out from there. But you guys have the Truff hot sauce brands, but then it's not just hot sauce, right? It's pasta sauce, it's mayonnaise, it's salts, it's oils. Tell us about, like, again, the taking of the market share. What can you share about, you know, now partnered with Sky, where you guys are hoping to take the business from here? Yeah, so those, so also, just so, so that sounds like a lot of products, but we could have a hundred products. You know, you can put truffle in a lot of things. Yeah. There's been so many different things that have come our way, and buyers want this, and consumers want that, but that was us, those six categories are us being extremely disciplined and saying no to most things. Those are the ones that made the most sense at this stage in the business. Um, we're very focused on flav flavor enhancement in a luxurious way and like elevating the everyday dinner or lunch. Um, with our newest product, which we, you know, we, we had our partnership in place before we locked it, was our green sauce, which just launched about three weeks ago. Three weeks, yeah. Two. Yeah. Uh, yeah, two weeks ago, and it's it's our first non-red sauce, so it's it's mm -hmm. still a jalapeno, just a green versus a red, which is the same thing, just the time on the vine it getting right. Um, and the the response has been incredible, and you know some of the things we're we're going to be doing together to just amplify it, are, we're very excited for. Um, and so when we look at like what's next, what's next, what's next, I think staying disciplined and focusing on things that fit our ethos and our thesis 
but doing it in a thoughtful and an artful way um, that you know we could we could really like pack a punch with something, but not getting so wide that we're in all these different categories and people look at the brand like what are they what are they good at you know. Mm -hmm. That's a good founder mentality, but like, what does the next phase of growth look like? Because you've already surmounted so many mountains. You're, on, you're in 20,000 stores worldwide. You've conquered direct-to-consumer. You've achieved viral sensation status. You have big partnerships in place. Project out for me whatever you can say. We have a room of investors here, but like, what would an ideal growth you know, strategy look like from here in the near term? I think more of everything you just said. And you know, we're, we're very conscious of um, remaining in that startup mentality. There's still a lot of upside, a lot of growth left. Yes, we're in over you know, 25,000 doors, but there's still a lot of households that don't have truff in their refrigerator. So for us, it's you know, household penetration. Let's get our velocities up in retail. Let's continue putting out that viral content. Let's continue to put out products that our customers love and enjoy and tell their friends about. Yeah, it's, it's a, uh, a product and a brand that, you know, again, in our, in our research and the work that we did, we, we figured out that very clearly people who have tried Truff love it, just not, a lot of, not enough people have found it yet. Exactly. And so the job is to get this product in more people's mouths mm -hmm. all around the world. Um, I think the channel strategy that you, are, you asked about a little bit earlier is really important. I think the best businesses and brands in the consumer space today, used to be people thought it was a binary thing, you're either an online right. brand or you're a bricks and mortar brand. The reality today is that the consumer expects great brands to be where she's shopping, right. uh, whether that's a bricks and mortar store or whether that's online or whether that's on Amazon or somewhere else. And um, you know, the guys have done a great job of making sure that they're in that right place. But our job is to help them get this product into more people's mouths because it is delicious. And once people try it, they remain lifelong customers. Yeah. We see that once they try the hot sauce, they're interested in the pasta sauce, they're interested in the oils and the salts. And so with a really focused product strategy and a really strong distribution strategy, amplifying the brand will, will fuel the growth for a long time to come. Yeah, so we just have a couple minutes left. I wanna ask one big picture question about Sky Partners' strategy moving forward. In many ways, you're one of one in the PE industry, right? You're unmatched in your, your competitive advantages and skill sets. So I wanna understand, are there any, what's next for Sky? Just like I asked, what's next for Truff? And then I wanna to shift to a little bit of a fun lightning round, if we have time. <laughs> um. What's next for Sky is, is that we continue to you know, build out our firm in a really careful and methodical way in the same way great consumer brands are built. Um, this was obviously our first investment. Your first investment says a lot about your strategy. You can tell people what your strategy is, but you ultimately need to show it uh, with, with great investments like uh, what we expect Truff will be. Um, you know, we, are, uh, we do believe that we are different and, and know that we're different relative to other private equity firms. I, I'm really privileged to have spent uh, nearly two decades inside of one of the greatest private equity firms that's ever been built. I learned a lot there and worked for great people and had the opportunity to partner with great founders across a number of different uh, consumer categories. But what we're doing here is marrying that experience that uh, we bring as a collective investment team from a bunch of great firms, but partnering with someone in Kim who understands the future of community building around brands. Uh, great brands figure out how to build community. The guys have used that term a couple of times in this conversation already. Uh, that community is built through authenticity, communicating with consumers in new and different ways, and leveraging the platforms that are on all of our phones that we carry around with us everywhere. So I think as you see the evolution of Sky, you'll see us continuing to back brands that figure out that, uh, that community element, and some of them are further along the journey than others, and our value creation plans, instead of being a, a very uh, uh, rote playbook of these are the mm -hmm. five things that Sky Partners will do. We spend a lot of time listening to our founder partners, learning what they want, what they don't want, what we can offer and what we can, and customize really um, uh, bespoke value creation plans for each situation that we face. But the, the common thread will be great products with an opportunity to build great community uh, because that's what drives long-term value creation in the consumer space. And you guys have both brought on great advisors, also external advisors, and you with Angela and Truff with uh, Mark. Can you talk to me about how you're planning to lean in and leverage those relationships? Yeah, I think with our case and Mark specifically, he's obviously a founder of a condiment business, built huge chocolate, sold it. Um, we're always like, we don't know what we don't know, so we just lock someone in a room and ask them a bunch of questions <laughs> and, and see, see what we learn. Um, and then for us, I think where we've mostly done advisors throughout the whole life cycle of Truff is when we genuinely don't know if to go right or left, we just ask a bunch of people what they think and gather as many insights as we can. And in this case, now we just have better people to ask better questions to. And big news with Angela coming on board. Talk to us really quickly about that. 
Yeah, Angela Arantz uh, joined Sky as a senior operating advisor. Angela had a distinguished career uh, with many companies, but most notably ran, uh, was the CEO of Burberry and, and ran one of the great brand rejuvenations, uh, you know, an amazing brand, but that had uh, needed, a, uh, you know, needed a, a bit of a spark, and she drove that, partnering with creative people and operations to you know, really drive that, and was very successful. And then she went on to do the same thing at Apple, running Apple Retail globally, and was um, an amazingly successful uh, executive there. She's now on our team, uh, yeah. advising us and helping us navigate a really complex consumer environment that um, has a lot of things intersecting at the same time. The more smart people you can put in the room, uh, the better decisions you'll make. And it's one of the reasons we're so aligned with these guys is because they operate with the exact same uh, mentality. So we're out of time, but I don't care. I need to ask this quick lightning round. <laughs> Favorite flavor of truff? Go. Green sauce. Green sauce. Since Jay said green sauce, I'll go with white sauce, but green sauce. OK. <laughs> green sauce. Okay. If you haven't it's... tried it, get to your local Whole Foods yes. uh, and pick it up. It's delicious. <laughs> it's very good. Yeah. I looked in my Whole Foods. It wasn't there yet. Sold, sold out. Sold, sold out. out. Sold yeah. out. Not that it wouldn't have been there otherwise. It was gone already off the shelf. <laughs> okay, last question. Favorite collaboration? Hidden Valley was iconic. Hidden Valley got the most, like, it created the biggest splash, and then... Sky Partners. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you. I'm gonna go with Popeyes. Uh, Popeyes, a, a great company that had built an iconic chicken sandwich, um, and and you know really changed the chicken sandwich market in the quick serve restaurant world. Decided to partner with these guys to put the spicy truff mayonnaise on it uh, late last year. An amazing partnership. Awesome. Well, we're out of time, but this was a fascinating conversation. Thank you guys so thank much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.